Syria. So, um, okay, thank you very much, Toshi, for having me here. Um, my name is Alex Garcia, and I uh, have been working together with, uh, with um, Tazro and Eric and other people uh, with, um, in, in, in the representation of uh, experimental protocols so that they can support uh, reproducibility. Um, basically, um, experimental protocols are like cooking recipes, and they contain, they contain very um, accurate descriptions of everything that someone has to do in a laboratory. So they, they have uh, ingredients, uh, and like, for instance, regions and samples. And they also have appliances that, in the case of a lab, uh, a lab work, that means that you have a very detailed list of equipments, including, um, including direct links to um, catalogs from manufacturers. Uh, they also have a list of instructions, which are the steps uh, to be undertaken uh, when executing a, uh, um, an, uh, any given experiment. And this list of experiments uh, usually are very carefully described. They usually have um, time, descriptions of, of what happens in intervals of times. They have critical steps. They have, um, they, there is also uh, annotations with respect to the limitations um, of um, the experimental protocol. There is also uh, and very uh, detailed annotations uh, with respect to um, um, hints uh, and troubleshootings uh, when, ex when executing an experimental protocol. So um, protocol basically should have uh, all the complete information that allows anybody to recreate an experiment. That, that is in theory. Um, what happens in practice is that experimental protocols are not always uh, very uh, well described and that they usually are distributed as PDFs. Uh, as, as, as any other kind of publication, but they are not just any other kind of publication because they are essentially workflows uh, with lots of different uh, kinds of annotations. Uh, so uh, where are we heading with all of this? So uh, we're going, uh, we want to have um, an experimental, uh, uh, we want to have a publication platform that allows uh, experimental protocols to be born semantics, meaning uh, that uh, we needed to have an ontology to represent those experimental protocols, but we also needed to know what were the meaningful entities that we were dealing with, and meaningful entities within the context of experimental protocols. Uh, we wanted to have machine processable workflows, meaning that we wanted to have uh, workflows, descriptions of workflows that were meaningful, not just for the human, but also for the robot. Um, and then we, we wanted to have this um, in, in, a, in, a, in a distribution mechanism that was pretty much the same one that uh, researchers are used to, meaning the PDF or HTML. So we created the ontology, we created um, an application, a web application that allows uh, people, uh, the researchers to uh, define the experimental protocol, to uh, specify the experimental protocol. Behind the scenes, what's happening is that we're just populating the ontology. So really here, um, the experimental protocol is, is, is to be born semantics. Uh, at the end of the day, what happens is that all of this represent, the representation and this uh, enriched uh, annotation that we have um, is being presented as HTML, as PDF, um, as JSON, and also as RD, um, RDF. Uh, we uh, make it possible to answer queries like, for instance, retrieve all the uh, diseases caused by regions in the protocol extraction of total RNA from fresh uh, frozen tissues. We also make it possible to answer other queries like, for instance, retrieve all the regions manufactured by sigma average in, the, in, in any given protocol, or retrieve all the protocols with uh, regions of type X. Uh, and as you can see there, not only we are using uh, federated, uh, not only we are using federated queries, but also, and, and probably more importantly, we are also uh, using some sort of uh, inference uh, that is implicit in the ontologies we're working with. Um, now we are uh, working, we have built all of these things, and we are working with the uh, Center for Open Science. We are um, running a preprint service uh, for experimental protocols. And we are now uh, integrating uh, our um, the smart protocol um, ontology to the uh, the OSF platform, so that people can um, define their experimental protocols in the way in the, in, uh, using this uh, very sophisticated uh, metadata uh, management. Um, and for this hackathon, we want to uh, validate our our model once more. We want to run it against uh, some published experimental protocols. We also want to test uh, the data we are capturing. We also want to start uh, collecting use cases for the robot so that we can facilitate the translation. We already have like 10 um, experimental protocols to, to be run by robots. Uh, and we also want to figure out how to power the Open Science Framework repository uh, with our uh, smart protocols approach. 
Uh, and also something that I want to start, I want to start a discussion about blockchain and IPFS uh, for um, information about um, information that is being produced in the lab. Thank you. Let's move on to the next speaker. Yep. Hey, so this is moving. Yeah. Hi. So my name is Juan Banda. I come from Stanford at Nigam Chas Lab. And my project here it's basically I'm trying to build a smart API for spontaneous reporting systems. So yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So the research problem that this is trying to facilitate is that the identification of various drug reactions during post marketing phase is one of the most important goals of drug safety. And the data that most people use for this is data that comes from spontaneous reporting systems, uh, which is you know traditional. Uh, data people use for drug safety surveillance and uh, hypothesis generation, validating new approaches. Basically, this data is submitted by people, by clinicians, and by drug companies, and it comes in forms of a bunch of reports. So the practical problem with this, at least for the spontaneous reporting system in the U.S., is that it's managed by the FDA, and is the adverse event reporting system, so it's fares. The issue is that this comes as it comes in a bunch of download the downloadable files by year. The data formats are messed up between years. The data is not clean. There's a lot of duplicate data, and it's somewhat standardized to only two different um, set vocabularies that people don't use that often. So you can start seeing what the problem with this data is. And the reality is that most researchers need to spend hours and hours curating it before even being able to use it. So the first solution to this that we came up with, with some people from the Odyssey group, which is a different thing. Uh, so we released a data set where we take care of all these problems in the sense that this is already curated, it's standardized to SNOMED and to RxNorm, which is more widely used. It's also all the deduplication is done. So, and it's one single download file where you can just install it in less than 45 minutes. But, I mean, still, this was nice. We got some pretty good press and actually managed to plug the biohackathon when the Dryad interviewed us for this data set. And, but the problem is, I still keep getting emails from researchers saying, oh, this is nice, but I, I, I don't want to have to load it. I want it to be available better and more easily. Or they just want to see numbers for a certain drugs or a certain part combination of drug outcome. And that's a very simple query. But you know, if the resource is not publicly available, loaded somewhere, then they're going to have to install it and take some time. So the idea was, well, why not? First, I thought, let's make it an RDF format. Then why not take it a little bit further and make a smart API that would allow people to access this data you know, and have it available. And the, the FDA actually did, does have an API for this, but their open FDA initiative has only four, uh, six years of data, so the data is completely outdated. It has data until 2013. Their API is very unfriendly, and a lot of people don't even know this exists. I actually got emails from people from the FDA asking to use our resource, and they didn't even know they had their own API to use it. So this is basically what I want to work with here. So if anybody's interested or is wanting to help, I'm, fairly, I'm completely new to Smart APIs and looking forward to making something cool and useful. And some quick acknowledgments to, uh, inviting, for inviting me here and to people in the lab and that I work with in this project. Cool. Yep. Hi, I'm Nao Sakoto. Uh, I'm dev developing BioRuby. So, uh, so BioRuby is an open source bioinformatics library and tools. 
writing in the Ruby programming language, programming language. and current version is 1.5.1. Um, uh, uh, we are developing GitHub Arena. We, are uh, we started this development in uh, 2000 and we are uh, nearly developing uh, 17 years. Uh, I'm participating in the uh, first biohackathon and um, I, I participated every year. So, um, including me, uh, uh, more than 30 people and the world have been contributed to biology. And there are many functions in biology, um, but some, fa some functions are outdated. And in addition to biology core, uh, many plugins and additional packages are available, um, as biogenes. Uh, the site is uh, maintained by Kyoto. Uh, see Biogems info for more information. And during the hackathon, uh, I plan to split BioRuby core package into several, uh, several uh, small gem packages because uh, BioRuby is very large. Uh, it is difficult to maintain. So, and uh, I'd like to remove some old functions. And uh, during the hackathon, some uh, refactoring and improvements. And uh, I'd like to release new version soon. And uh, if you are interested, please join us. And in addition to uh, ViRuby, uh, I'm also participated in SciRuby. Uh, SciRuby is uh, numeric and scientific computing for Ruby language. And SciRuby JP is Japanese communities uh, because uh, Mats, uh, Mats, Mats and many uh, Ruby developers are living in Japan. So uh, in SciRuby JP, uh, to promote developing scientific software, including statistics and machine learning. And in addition, uh, is, there is PyCall, uh, calling Python functions from Ruby, uh, developed by uh, Murata-san. So um, in just immature idea, but um, I, I'd like to try to call Py by Python from and uh, there is Red Data Tools, uh, developed, uh, founded by Kohei Sto and collaborators. Uh, this project uh, develops uh, data processing tools for Ruby, uh, including Ruby bindings of Apache Arrow. So I'd like to uh, collaborate with these projects and developing Ruby, Ruby tools for buying Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Leila Yael. I work with Uniprot at Bolivia, and today I'm going to talk about an Elixir project named uh, Bioschemas. So Bioschemas is a community effort aiming to add a life sciences layer to schema.org. Schema.org makes it easier to add a semantic markup to web pages. So for instance, um, search engines like Google can be more accurate in finding results when it uh, is related to semantics. Bioschemas has four main stages. The first one is um, extending the vocabulary that is already defined in schema.org in order to cover uh, life sciences entities. 
The second stage is evaluating and tuning these specifications of work on the first stage. The second phase is then uh, testing the adoption. So we will mark up some web pages in some uh, pre-selected data resources. And the fourth and final phase is implementing some practical examples that uh, will extract and take advantage of the markup done on the web pages on the previous phase of this project. There are different uh, working groups in bioschemas, some of them working on generated entities just, such as uh, data sets and their repositories, and some others working with uh, life sciences related entities like laboratory protocols and biological entity. The biological entity acts as a wrapper around some tailored profiles like uh, phenotypes, proteins, and samples. All of the groups have already um, defined the use cases and all of them are working with the specification. Some few have already advanced to the next stages. The use cases that we have identified for bioschemas are first findability particularly when it is regarding to the results retrieved by search engines. Uh, the accessibility as well, due to the common format that the web pages mark up with various schemas will use. Building a resource index is another use case, and uh, these will use all that data mark up with various schemas and pointing to ontological terms. And summarization, so whenever someone is looking for a biological entity in a Google or Yahoo or etc. will get one of these kind of info boxes that you get whenever you're looking for a movie or a recipe in Google. Uh, this is a general schema with the main elements that we are working in bioschemas. For the biohackathon, we are going to focus on the life sciences entities, particularly lab protocol and biological entity. Because biological entity is a wrapper, then we want it to be as flexible and extensible as possible. So it will not only cover uh, proteins, phenotypes, and samples that are the group that we are working on now, but also will later cover some other entities as well. So anybody is welcome to contribute and give feedback. Please do. So it would be really a good specification. And that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to the Biohackathon for this opportunity and to all the Bioschemas and Elixir community. Hello, my name is Tarcisio, and I'm actually a postdoctoral fellow in the University of Lausanne, and also I'm affiliated to the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. The work that we present now is uh, about storing and curing evolutionary relationships among millions of genes in the OMA database using RDF. Uh, the context of this work actually in 2016. Uh, an ontology to represent the ontology uh, information was proposed, namely ontology ontology, but still to represent the data that you have in NOMA, we had to, to improve this ontology, also extend it, and also uh, to be also compliant with description logics. Uh, because we have another goal that's to simplify the task of writing queries and also reduce the number of uh, storage triples. Then as, we, as our approach is based on logics, on uh, a, a rule based uh, logic approach, then we have to have a, a DL compliant ontology. This is a uh, portion of the ortho ontology. Uh, the main ontology information actually is represented, uh, we can say, as a, as a, uh, a data, a tree data structure. Then uh, that the main thing is about the ortho loss clusters and the parallel loss clusters and the relationship uh, has homologs. We have here. Um, then the, this summarizes uh, what we have done uh, in terms of extension. 
Uh, one thing that's important is for us to improve interoperability. We explicitly define uh, cross-reference properties, and the idea is also uh, in the ontology to improve the interoperability among the different databases in life, in life science, actually, or ontology, and so on. Then, uh, as I said, one of our goals was to simplify the, query, the, the queries that we write. Uh, this query is one of the most important in our case because it, this query is the one that we retrieve the, uh, or is orthologs to relationship. Uh, but it's quite um, complicated to write and understand. Then this is a, a kind of, uh, one of the examples that I can tell you in our case. Uh, then instead of doing that, we, we, use a, uh, we can use uh, a simple relationship, uh, is orthologs too. That in this case has orthologs that I name it, but it could be is orthologs too. Um, that should be inferred during query, query execution time. By applying this logical rule, um, that's in to summarize, it's like a, the, the graph pattern that you can see in the previous query, but represented as a horn like rule. By doing so as well, as a consequence, uh, we can also reduce the number of storage triples. For this specific example, instead of uh, materializing two, two billions, more than two billions of triples to only represent the is orthologs to relationship, uh, we, we use that rule that will be um, triggered during query execution time. Then, then to, for comparison reasons, we only need like a 17 uh, million of triples um, to, to implicitly define these pairwise orthologs by using the, this uh, hierarchical orthologs group, this kind of tree, to represent the orthology information. <laughs> and to conclude this work, um, then we have like presented like a, um, uh, an extension of the ontology. We have explicitly defined cross-reference to enhance uh, interoperability. Uh, also, we have defined a, a fine-grained ontology that some of the terms will be inferred during query execution time so no, instead of being uh, materializing the, the, the triple store. Um, also, we is approach description logic and logical rules are based in. And this is uh, currently available uh, this part on any point, but in this case, we don't have the, the layer, the logical layer here, because this triple store is the virtuous, then it's not, doesn't, uh, doesn't um, support uh, logical rules, then, but we can use, for this work, I actually I use the virtuoso triple store, that, not virtuoso, I mean, star dog triple store that you can use, uh, that you can define logical rules uh, to be triggered during query execution time. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Hajime Suzuki from the University of Tokyo. I will introduce about my new software, Align software, about the mini Align. Um, all, most of you already may know about the mini Align sequencer by Oxford Nanopore, which generates a few gigabases um, within a um, few dozens of hours of run. And we can get a huge amount of sequences in fast file format, but what about downstream analysis is still heavy, um, still heavy computational burden, and it requires mapping uh, about 100 CPU hours with current de facto standard BWM software. Uh, some can use clusters, and some others can wait for night, overnight, but it is still fast, uh, still is fast is better. Uh, for example, uh, when we want to analyze if such a sequence is on your laptop in the field or in the Antarctica or in the other spaces. And Minialign is my uh, answer to this problem. It's fast alignment to design for bio and nanopore long release. It's very fast and 
it can align pain databases of human genomes onto uh, haploid human uh, reference sequences within five minutes on eight core uh, desktop computer. Uh, it is even possible to run such a task on your laptop with uh, 16 gigabytes of memory. Comparing MiniAlign to the uh, other traditional <laughs> mapping tools like PWM, it is 100 times faster than, and even three times faster than Minimap 2, which is recently developed by MD. It is proved that one also as sensitive as PWM and Blazor uh, on a simulated nanopore human data set. And, but as I uh, recognized before, uh, the mapping quality estimation minimal is poor for now, uh, which is indicated by NB in the uh, recent minimap to uh, preprint. Uh, let me introduce about minimal internal minimal algorithm. It is basically seed, chain, and extend. And the seed collection and chaining algorithm is basically based on the uh, minimap algorithm and original ones are the extension routines and which which adopt SIMD SIMD parallelized fast extension. And the alignment routine Libgada is design graph oriented, that is it allows concatenation of certain segments as inputs uh, in a dynamic uh, manner. A second segment, uh, for example, when then to tail, head, tail to head is a simple graph, and it is actually a circular gem like uh, mitochondria and so on. And we can align a long, long read onto such a genome by turning around it multiple times. And Libgaba and MiniAlign uh, currently can't but conceptually can uh, do such a task. And I will add this feature to MiniAlign in the next release. I'm currently testing this new uh, circular alignment algorithm on uh, real nanopore dataset, and also several improving improvements will be uh, planned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for basic team for discussing about uh, alignment algorithm and Katayama san for holding uh, by Hakkasan and inviting Colin Herkes uh, and also Novo Align. And I discussed about uh, past alignment algorithm with him at Bio Hakkasan 15 in Nagasaki. Thank you. Is this yes? No, okay. Great. Um, first, I want to thank uh, the organizers for the Biohackathon for letting us continue uh, our work in this direction. My name is Seth Carbon from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I'll be talking about Noctua, our modeling tool, the models we produce, and connecting them out to the greater web. Um, so first, the hat I'll be wearing mostly at this Biohackathon is with the Gene Ontology. Uh, it's a collection, it's a consortium of about 30 uh, resources that produces the gene ontology, produces, has annotation and curation efforts, and also produces a lot of ontology software. Uh, about 45,000 terms with annotations over about 1 million genes and gene products, 6.5 million annotations, and about 10 times more if you consider the uh, annotations brought in uh, by uh, computers. So. Historically, the gene ontology has used a data model that is very disjoint. Um, and basically, it doesn't allow self-referencing. It's not a very good uh, informational model, but it's what we've had. Um, it, you can do a lot of things with it. You can store a lot of information in it, but you can't really produce really good biological models with it. So that's what we're going to be looking at. So starting a couple of years ago, uh, piloted by uh, Paul Thomas down at USC, we've started working on the gene ontology causal activity model, which is a different way, a uh, much more rich way of modeling biology. So essentially what we have is a gene product, uh, a molecular function, a biological process, and a cellular component, all wild, wired together in a very sort of nice, graph-friendly way. 
Uh, not shown here is all the metadata for groups, timestamps, users, as well as the evidence model. But this is a basic building block that we're now working with. This is, we're referring to this as an anaton. So just real quick, the anatons, uh, this is another visualization of that as the editors in our tool often see it, and a little bit more compact version of the same thing. So we can take these anatons and wire them together into much richer models. So here you can see we had an instance of intestinal inflammation in worm. Um, and you can sort of really get down into sort of how the biology is actually being modeled by biologists. Um, so this brings us back to Noctua. Noctua is a stack for the collective, for the collaborative editing of RDF instance graphs for modeling biological processes. So we both have an interactive, collaborative uh, visual graph editor as well as other clients. So it's designed to be very open, it's an open stack. People can plug into it, write their own clients very easily. Um, and so a graph editor and then a tabular editor for some of the biologists who aren't really, you know, we're slowly migrating people over to the new system. We have a couple of mods already on it, um, and hopefully we'll get more of the model organisms onto it soon as well. Uh, so since the last biohackathon, we've had a lot of uh, changes within the Noctua world. So we're now using Blaze Graph internally in production. We have live reasoning available to editors via Arachne, so maybe I can mention that in a moment. Our models are now available as part of our new data pipeline, so all of these rich models are available to everyone. And we also now have a public Sparkle um, endpoint via Blaze Graph for all of this new information that we're producing. Uh, so this is kind of a sky-high view of what our pipeline looks like. We still have the legacy stuff coming through the top being converted into the new model. Uh, and down below, we have the uh, native, you know, GoCam models being produced within Noctua, going through the Arachne Reasoner, produced by uh, Jim Balhoff uh, at RINC. Um, and this is all being assembled into our Blaze Graph endpoint. So we still have the legacy, the raw, and everything piled together for the consumption uh, for the rest of the world. So what I'd like to do at the Biohackathon is create um, some JavaScript packages for our Noctua system to be able to start interacting with Sparkle endpoints out there in the world. A lot of the work that everyone here has been working on for so long. Um, and we'd like to bring in this metadata and other data in for curators working on, you know, on their annotations live within the system. I'd also like to get a little bit more uh, feel for how our system is going to work out in the real world and, under, and help everyone here, people who are interested in using our data, help you understand our data model and how to access it whether from the legacy formats or from our, our new system. Uh, and other hats, other things I'd like to do for the Biohackathon, uh, for Monarch data, um, possibly working uh, as a liaison for getting the JPhenome data in. Any help for people with GoData, as I mentioned. Uh, a application level user and data sharing for curation annotations, so basically allowing applications to move data back and forth between uh, each other. Anyone interested in Noctua development? And also the Reasonable Data Project, which is discussing uh, people who are interested in discussing how licensing affects uh, data synthesis and redistribution in the sciences. So if you have questions about any of those, I'd love to talk about them. And uh, I just want to give everyone a big thanks. And that went a lot faster than I timed it out earlier. <laughs> Is fine? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is my first biohackathon. My name is David Steinberg, and I'm from the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute. Uh, I'm separate from the rest of the UCSC team that's here that works on VG. Uh, I've been working on uh, GA4GH and the genomics APIs and have recently switched over to working on the human cell atlas. So I'm hoping to get you uh, familiar with GA4GH if you aren't already uh, aware of what that is, and hopefully excited about HCA because it's going to be a huge project that hopefully you'll all be using this data at some point, and if you get involved now, you'll be able to affect what that data looks like in the future. Um, I'm a bioinformatics programmer. I've been at the Genomics Institute for about two years. I'm very partial to LISP and uh, a couple of the uh, uh, projects out there. 
are in that uh, vein. But I'm currently working under David Hostler and Benedict Payton. Um, so uh, G4GH, who's heard of it and who hasn't? I see some hands, great, I don't have to count them, but it's the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And uh, I think it's somewhat influenced by uh, what Toshiaki's done, uh, an effort to really federate and get all of the genomics data uh, available on a global scale, whereas the uh, DVCLS has been for Japan. Um, there are a couple of different approaches to how to do this, and I've been working on the Genomics API, which is a set of HTTP methods for accessing genomics data in a standardized format. Um, here's a quick uh, diagram of how it's uh, worked in practice for um, some of the early iterations of this. Uh, it, you have multiple data backings, and you put an HTTP server between your data as it currently exists, and if this HTTP server uh, provides the GA4GH methods, then you are GA4GH compliant for your data. Uh, what's the point of that? Uh, well, I don't think I need to convince anybody here that there's a reason to do this. Uh, RDF and Sparkle are clearly the way that um, the linked data approach is. This uh, is the same sort of approach. It's a simplified client that does basic uh, REST style calls, but uh, in theory, you will be able to access data in many sites uh, using these uh, same methods. So what kind of methods am I talking about? Um, we're really talking about data interchange here and not data analysis. So it's uh, kind of the same things that you expect to do with SAM tools. Uh, tell me all of the variants that you have uh, in this chromosome between these two regions. And this data will be sent back to you over HTTP, JSON format, something that you can easily parse. Uh, Previous hackathons uh, with this work, um, I wrote uh, with the help of a couple of others, uh, a shim server into NCBI's uh, data uh, that presented the GA4GH methods for accessing NCPI data. So I could then use the client that we had written elsewhere for GA4GH uh, endpoints for accessing data in NCBI. Uh, so why am I here? Uh, other than the fact that my previous colleague uh, has good taste in uh, booze, uh, and Toshiaki agrees, I think that uh, I'm here because uh, just, um, I guess it's been almost a year and a half now, two years, that uh, Toshiaki came out and showed me he had actually done the server that I had been working on as a linked data server. So it provided both the REST style methods that the GA4GH had been putting together, as well as a full Sparkle endpoint. Um, so I think that this type of approach was very exciting for me to see, and so I'm glad to be here to get to continue to talk about that. Um, I think uh, to give you an idea of, uh, of, you know, a little bit more of the impetus behind this is that a couple of people have brought up this, um, an issue that I try to explain as the difference between interchange and analysis of data. Sparkle and RDF allows for a great deal of analysis to occur at query time. And um, this allows you to get back only the data that you want. And uh, it's, it's very powerful. But when you're working with uh, uh, simple HTTP calls, then you're getting something that's much too verbose. You only get, uh, you get way more data than you meant to get. And um, it can be slow. And so uh, I hope to... Uh, help this field a little bit by separating out the concerns of analysis and interchange. And um, with my last 40 seconds, I want to get you excited about another acronym that's shorter than GA4GH, which is HCA, the Human Cell Atlas, which is an effort to catalog all of the healthy uh, human cell types across a number of different um, donors. And so this will be a multi-cloud infrastructure. Uh, these data are already being um, pushed out onto Amazon, some of the prototypes. Uh, and my job is uh, more or less uh, moving data around and then providing it in a way back to this community that they can use. Um, so how am I doing that? Well, uh, one of, yes, five minutes, is CellDB. So talk to me about CellDB and talk to me about HDA. Perfect. 
Okay, thank you very much for having me, Toshiaki, and the other organizers. Um, my name is Orion Buskey. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Uh, today I will be briefly talking about two uh, open source projects that we develop in our lab, Phenotips and Phenome Central, and then an international collaboration that we're a part of called the Matchmaker Exchange. So I want to start by motivating this with a description of sort of some of the cases that we end up seeing. So this is Noah. Uh, he presented with ataxia and developmental delay. He was seen by a, a collaborator of ours, uh, Kim Boycott, up at CHEO in Ottawa. Uh, they did an exome to try to figure out what was wrong. Uh, they found variants in a gene that hadn't been previously implicated in any human disease. And so they sort of at that point thought that they had an answer but needed to find additional unaffected, sorry, additional affected individuals in other families in order to confirm that finding, right? This is a very common uh, situation in dealing with ultra rare diseases. You have one patient and you have to find others with the same condition elsewhere in the world. And this is really a global problem, right? You have one patient somewhere on the planet and rare diseases aren't specific to different localities. You have to look everywhere. Um, and this is really where standardized data and, and data sharing are, are critical. So the big push that we've been sort of a part of is trying to get doctors to transition from writing down uh, clinic notes on paper to entering them into computers to describing them in standardized terminologies that actually allow us to analyze it with, with a growing e uh, ecosystem of, of software tools to do things like predict diagnoses, um, or, or suggest candidate genes. This allows us to share this information globally and across different languages. You can map the HPO to different languages and now all of a sudden researchers from around the world can communicate using a shared scientific semantic language. And it also allows us to do things like patient matchmaking where we use semantic similarity measures to find other patients out there in the world that are phenotypically similar but not necessarily identical, which is difficult if you're doing something with a linguistic model, especially if it's across different languages. So one of the challenges that we face here is how do we get doctors to actually go through the process of describing their patients using some standardized terminology when it's oftentimes a lot faster for them to scribble some illegible uh, thing down on a piece of paper. So there are some carrots that we try to build into the tools that we develop, uh, and then there are some sticks. So to talk about uh, one of the papers that Tudor brought up earlier, some new journals, for instance, are mandating that authors that describe cases and case reports describe them additionally in, in computational methods using like HPO terms, for instance, uh, alongside it so that computers can actually start to understand this data without trying to do sort of probabilistic parsing. So to talk a little bit about phenotypes, this is an open source tool that we've developed in our, in our group uh, about five years ago or so. It's used at hospitals uh, and research centers around the world. It's really designed to make it as easy as possible for doctors and researchers to describe patients, particularly rare disease patients, using the HPO underneath. So it has quick search, which is error tolerant and things like that. Uh, and it has text mining based on, on free text fields, so clinic notes and indication for referral, things like that. We suggest HPO terms based on those. It also is being internationalized, so the HPO and uh, phenotypes are, are translated into Spanish. Phenotypes is translated into French, but the HPO isn't complete, and, and both of those are in progress in, in Japanese right now. So phenotypes is installed at about 25 different sites, uh, with about 2.6 thousand different users and about 30,000 patient records that we're aware of. It's an open source tool so anyone could set these up. So now that we have these patients use it, entered in systems like this, how do we share them and how do we find matches? So we built a system called Phenome Central, which is basically an installation of phenotypes in the cloud that anyone can contribute to. Um, it also has some additional uh, benefits inside of it that perform things like patient matchmaking based on similarities of phenotypes and it has, it has exome data analysis built in too, so we include genetic information in that matching. Phenotypes and, and patient archive, which is uh, Monarch and Tudor Groza's system, both can push data into Phenome Central so that if you have clinical data at a hospital behind a firewall, you can actually push that over a JSON API into Phenome Central. Right now we're at about 3,000 
different cases and a thousand users. This is part of the matchmaker exchange, um, which is an international collaboration of a bunch of different sites that has about seven uh, published findings with 21 in prep. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ryota Yamanaka. I'm a database engineer from Oracle Corporation. And uh, uh, for, uh, during this uh, biohackathon, I'm going to work with this project called ICGC Linked Data. Uh, ICGC is an uh, international cancer genome consortium, which is uh, providing the information of more than uh, 20,000 donors and their somatic uh, uh, semantic mutation data. And uh, um, now, uh, well, uh, two years ago, I have uh, uh, made a pipeline to uh, produce LDF data of project information, don uh, donor sample uh, mutation information from um, ICGC data portal and uh, uh, for, for integrating uh, the data with uh, other uh, public linked data such as rare variant information of uh, uh, Japanese uh, cohort or something. And, and uh, uh, during this uh, biohackathon, uh, I'd like to uh, make a, um, um, uh, easy and reproducible um, data conversion pipeline, uh, which can uh, 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 transform the data, uh, table data, uh, to LDF data. Uh, it is quite important for us to have a, a concrete um, reproducible pipeline for uh, generating LDF data. D this is quite easy, but uh, um, uh, actually uh, we should uh, put all these uh, pipeline into a Docker container or something so that we can uh, e easily and reproducibly uh, repeat the data creation. Um, <clears throat> so for this, um, uh, when we have uh, a table uh, data, uh, the uh, reproducible LDF data generation workflow can uh, consist of uh, data normalization and uh, L2RM mapping or other LDF mapping. So um, uh, initially, I was using uh, MySQL D2RQ virtual so for uh, normalization, LDF mapping, construct queries uh, respectively, but uh, uh, now I'm making the, uh, the new uh, workflow with Oracle database only. And the Oracle database has an um, um, LDF Sparkle engine as well as r 2 ml mapping engine. So, um, um, and additionally, I am uh, interested in uh, using a uh, graph database for, uh, uh, for um, graph-based query, uh, uh, such queries and uh, ID mapping and etc. So for these, uh, for uh, performance optimization using prop property graph, which uh, means, uh, uh, which, which is same as uh, graph database, is, is quite a unique option. And uh, for retrieving the information, uh, for, for example, the information, uh, resources uh, linking from a specific donor, uh, the traversing uh, operation of the graph database should be uh, optimal. And so for this, uh, using graph database, uh, uh, Neo4j and Oracle uh, graph database can be uh, options. And uh, at, the same at the same time, executing uh, graph alg algorithms such as page rank and uh, uh, shortest path uh, we can use uh, GraphX, NetworkX, iGraph, uh, Oracle, Python, etc. But at the same time, uh, I'm, I'd like to uh, think of the uh, PG, uh, PG mapping, uh, which means uh, LDF to pay, uh, property graph uh, mapping uh, function, no Oracle. So um, uh, uh, for, for uh, this uh, biohackathon, I'm going to uh, try. Uh, this uh, PG mapping function of uh, uh, other databases and Oracle database. Uh, this uh, or, uh, property graph graph database function of Oracle is freely available from here. So um, uh, please try, and uh, if you have any question, uh, please uh, let me know. Uh, so finally, uh, we, uh, I would like to have the, have this uh, uh, reproducible data generation pipeline, which is on uh, Docker and using Oracle database. And uh, I'd like to try some uh, graph uh, analysis, analytics on uh, Oracle Labs PGX as well. So um, um, 
by the end of this uh, biohackathon, uh, I would like to um, um, just remove all this all this uh, pipeline. That uh, maybe the next time uh, uh, DBCLs people can uh, uh, can um, uh, run the Docker container to uh, make the updated uh, RDF data. So uh, so we can uh, always remove uh, this Docker container and uh, run again. So uh, we can uh, protect ourselves from uh, uh, the uh, Oracle legal department, which uh, often sue us. So thank you. This one? No. That's right there. Yeah, no, um, I think I don't read this. You should you can expand right there. It's okay. But yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Tiffany Callahan, and I'm from the University of Colorado Denver. I'm a PhD student co-advised by Dr. Larry Hunter and Dr. Michael Kahn. Uh, thank you so much for having me here, and special thanks to Jindang and Toyofumi for agreeing to work on this project with me. Um, what we are hoping to start doing is to leverage linked open data sources to annotate the function of disease-associated genes that are previously uncharacterized in the literature. So it doesn't work? Oh, okay. That'll be fine. Okay. Uh, so this, this project really hinges on two questions. So given a disease of interest, how many differentially expressed genes are uncharacterized? And when we annotate them, how do these genes functionally and mechanistically differ from genes that are well studied? And so this idea has been um, coined as the ignorum. So it's it focuses on genes whose transcripts are differentially expressed, uh, but there's no currently published evidence that connects either the gene or the gene product to the disease itself. And so it's a really interesting and potentially fruitful area for doing inference over. And so there's been two real most prior attempts to doing this, and we will leverage the really good parts of what they've done as well as try to make some extensions to what they've done. One of one of the challenges um, in doing this is to pick a good use case, one that has clear clinical characteristics, uh, is well known, but also in this case, um, considered to be a rare disease. Uh, and in this case, we've just selected preeclampsia, and it has good um, substantial public health impact in terms of if we can make more progress in understanding it and uh, solving it, we could stand to go a long way. Um, so it accounts for 18% of maternal deaths and 40% of fetal deaths. The only cure is to um, deliver the placenta, and that results in a lot of preterm birth. Um, it's also really interesting from a biological perspective because it's tissue that represents two genomes, both the maternal and the fetal genome. Um, so it's an exciting use case. And I can't fit this all on the page, so I'll scroll. Um, I will admit I cheated a little and got a head start with our general pipeline. So we, I worked with a biologist to look over all the data sets on GEO that were for human data as well as preeclampsia. And of the 68 possible data sets, we narrowed it down to 14 to start with, um, using some selection criteria. This is rich data. It spans nine different countries and over 11 different years of um, repository data. So it's, it's good. It's for over 150 samples. Um, and so we'll, if, depending on what's available on GEO, if they have raw data, we reanalyzed it platform specific uh, to try to make it as normalized as possible. Uh, but if they didn't have that, we would take whatever they had, verify what had been processed, um, do some extra filtering, and then move it through the rest of our pipeline. So we will identify differentially expressed genes through various methods. We'll com combine them and create one list. Um, and then we'll do two different types of approaches, a literature driven and an annotation driven approach. Um, using some great tools developed by people in this room. And the most exciting part for me will then be to take what we can get from the literature and the annotations 
uh, discover which of those is the ignore and which would be the difference of both of those lists, and then to do some um, fun <laughs> inference to see how we can connect the genes that aren't known with genes that are well studied and hopefully tell a good story. So thank you again for having me and uh, for the best of the people on this slide for making this possible. Yeah. Let me just go on with the curve. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, hi, I'm Thomas Wilder from the Technical Nature Research Institute. Uh, I first like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I will talk uh, about a recent project of us, uh, which is centered around the flora phenotype ontology, the main ontology for tracking data. The flora phenotype ontology and the starting point at a very similar event to this one, the Biohexen. Um, 2014 in Leiden, organized by Rutger Foss, and our approach there was to develop a data driven extraction uh, of plant trade data information pipeline from digitized floras, uh, which could cover uh, content in multiple languages. Before I lose everybody who is not familiar with the con content uh, flora, the floras I talked about, there are two kinds. There is the uh, ball lowercase flora, which is the taxonomic composition of plant life in a particular region, probably defined by political boundaries. Not necessarily, and the flora with the uppercase F, and this is basically a book, or nowadays a digital resource, which describes uh, or details the floras uh, which are covered in plant life. The applications are ecology, systematics, and of course, plant breeding, agroecology, blah blah blah, everything. Um, which covers plants. Uh, briefly to the workflow, we used, uh, this was basically designed by Rob Hildor. We used existing ontologies, in particular phenotype qualities, PATO and the plant ontology, PO, uh, uh, and harvested several floras, did some text mining on it, identified uh, attribute terms for PATO and entity terms from the plant ontology, and built up a new ontology based on automatic reasoning and uh, addressed data with that. This ended with a clean separation between ontology, where all the uh, plant terms are in, and only plant terms are in which have a functional annotation, also which have really trait data behind it, and a knowledge base uh, in the form of the Spark Triple Store, which covers, I think, around 3 million triples now, and has taxa data in it, trait information pairs, and uh, the trait classes which can be used to describe the ontology. This is a brief look at the ontology. It has very similar following to morphology of plants, uh, anatomical spaces, on the other side, uh, plant structures. For example, the differentiation between shoot system, root system, and so on, and on the shoot system, of course, and all the leaf phenotype and flower type, and so on. There are other ontologies covering this. They are quite similar. For example, the plant ontology already mentioned, the plant trait ontology, or top deserts of plants. Uh, what's particularly or probably original with uh, Flobo, as we think, is it covers a lot of white trait data, in particular the biodiversity of wild types. And uh, here you have some of these traits for Azumia Picata, probably better read them. First grills, but we have flower white, fetal amount, leaf simple, and so on. So more common. But the florist types are in there, and so there are already very specific traits inside, which might usefully connect to genomics data or to other ecological data. This is a very short look to the raw data we use. This is uh, a form of description we use to harvest. Sometimes they're even more uh, marked up already. There are not all of this raw data type, but uh, this is a very raw data. And you see usually they have habitat sections, they have descriptions, and in the description you have tree or bark brown, and from this bark brown attribute and entity we build as an ontology. For example, here's from both flower reds, straight from uh, uh, the protein representation, but also there's habitat information, and there's a lot of uh, uh, numerical data like leaf forms and so on that come to this later. Uh, a first application we did is very simple. It was already mentioned today. It's a representation analysis. We did some tests for over and under representation of particular traits with it uh, to make use of this ontology, uh, working towards a little, yeah, what could be later be probably the easiest distribution model. So we checked are the specific types of rules over representation or under representation. This is always a test for over representation, this is under representation. And you see, we can say, okay, for this kind of plant and for example, they are probably more likely or very likely to be a good plant as a Others are not likely to appear in grassland. Uh, some topics follow straight of the current state uh, of the ontology, which is still very basic and has to be improved. I mean, the representation of habitat, what I showed was a very basic step. This has to be improved, the integration of animal, for example. Uh, we have the idea to adapt the model for cross-DB uh, queries for uh, genomics and systems biology data. 
This is a little bit different because data in, in the flora is mostly morphological. So probably we find not that much, so we have to enrich it and do additional annotations. And what also is currently missing uh, is the uh, covering of quantitative effects. So I want to get this matrix, and this is quite obvious. Uh, I come to the last point, this was already mentioned. We uh, have additional training data from a deep learning approach. This is done by Mona and Shivani, already mentioned today, which was a PhD student of uh, Rob. And we use images, do deep learning on this image and extract additional traits. So the idea is use deep learning to extract additional images. It's not very easy. Uh, uh, I have to be very brief on this and go very fast over this. Due to the current state of the metadata, which is accompanying these pictures, uh, uh, usually there are taxonomical issues, so we have to harmonize synonyms. There are problems uh, with trait description, which are mostly on the, the species level, not on the individual trait. And we have, want to have fully done this in the data set, all of this. So the idea probably for this, is, for this hackathon is to work a little bit with that, not to get the full pipeline working, but to get, for example, some metadata formats or boundaries, how uh, uh, to describe and how to establish this workflow. So one idea already was uh, to uh, define a format for the features in the deep learning network, which I find very simple because it's very hard to reproduce already established image patterns. Thank you very much. Sorry for being so long. Yeah. Uh, this one? Yes. To go forward? Yeah, right, yeah. right there. Hello, my name is Raul Bonal, and uh, I'm working for IMGM, which is a kind of uh, institute based on uh, immunology. So, if you are some interested in immunology, please step by Milan and maybe give a talk. Uh, uh, the project that uh, I'm talking about is uh, to tracking the single cell workflow pipeline analysis because we are analyzing single cell data, and it's more than one year that we have the machines and that we are producing data. We are working on two different kinds of uh, cancer cell, uh, tumor and um, lung and colorectal cancer with two platforms, Tenex and Fluidami. Uh, we are not alone, as we said before. Also, the human cell atlas is going to produce a lot of uh, uh, genomics information on uh, single cells. And the advantage of single cell is that you can uh, discover new cell type, but also progenitors or um, uh, subpopulations. And um, um, for the analyzing single cell data, uh, we are using, not, develop, not developing, but using machine learning algorithms for uh, detecting, in this case, uh, uh, grouping, clustering uh, cell populations. And uh, also, uh, it's possible using machine learning algorithms to detect uh, cell time or, let's say, uh, defined trajectories for uh, the cells in, uh, in the analysis. Uh, the, uh, these are our data set, some of them. So we are tracking peripheral blood, uh, normal tissue uh, in, uh, inside the, the tumor, and uh, uh, T-Rex inside the, the tumor tissue. We use uh, some kind of analysis tools, like uh, the gene set enrichment analysis for detecting um, um, cells population inside the uh, global cells. And we were able to detect uh, most of the uh, immune cells uh, that are present uh, nearby the tumor or inside the tumor, but some of them are not uh, available. Um, obviously, you can also use markers uh, to depict uh, the, the cluster of cells and be sure that uh, those markers are the ones that are used by the fax facility for sorting. And uh, the pipelines, there are many pipelines, uh, quite similar for the two, two platforms, uh, both the uh, Fluidam or the Tenex, but they have uh, differences. And uh, these differences are in the algorithm, but also in how the um, Bioinformaticians decide uh, which parameters to use uh, for filtering the, the data. Also, in the data reduction, so at the PCA here, at this level, where you are using PCA, TSNI, and also after cluster 8 techniques, uh, the end user is uh, going to uh, make choices that is very difficult to, to track. 
And uh, so the goal for me in this hackathon is to try to uh, design our workflow or a way to uh, enrich uh, a workflow for a single cell using linked data and uh, in an interactive way. So um, in the lab we are using uh, Jupyter or uh, our studio with uh, our markdown. I would like to explore with you, with your expertise, uh, if it's possible to embed uh, in this environment uh, linked data, maybe as a JSON-LD, and uh, also try to understand how to annotate the images, the information that are embedded in the, in the images. And uh, this could be also connected to the idea of job, and maybe also uh, what mentioned Michel uh, yesterday in engaging people in, in, in the lab as a real end user and um, make the, the workflow real, really uh, available and reusable to, to, to the people. And this is the, the, our lab. I want to thank them. And these are the uh, organizations that are uh, funding the projects. And uh, I want to thank uh, the BioArchaton, the BioArchaton organizers, and especially uh, Toshiaki. This was in the 2008. And uh, we were working with Bills, obviously, uh, at the BioRuby project at that time. Thank you.